Okay, hello and welcome back. Um, this is sadly not the actual live stream of my first playthrough. Um, somehow the stream dropped uh, partway through my live stream, and the part the the gap is kind of an important part of the story. So um, I'm just re-recording this off stream and uploading this to YouTube. Um, so yes, this is Andromeda 6, episode 7 was released on July 1st, so naturally I played it uh, the very first day. There was no way I was going to wait until Sunday. Besides, I wanted to uh, continue doing um, our life on Sundays. Anyway, um, basically the main character is one of three races, human, Catalpin, you can tell by the neck, and, um, or Talarin. Um, Talarin aren't all blue, they do have other skin tones. Um, so, I was playing a completely different, um, doing a completely different save, but the computer I had that on, I, um, deleted it without transferring that save. So, the... I'm going ahead and playing through what I call consider my canon traveler um, and basically it's the I the way I do games like this where you end up with several different romances the first romance is what I consider my canon ro romance and then I play the others to um, see how those romances go uh, but the first one is usually what I consider my canon, um, especially in games like um, Dragon Age or Mass Effect, where it's multiple games. My canon is my first playthrough in each, so like in um, Dragon Age, my canon warden is a Dalish elf, and my canon hawk is obviously hawk, but um, female hawk. And she's a rogue, and my Tanner Warden is also a female and a rogue. Archer rogue, I should say. And my Canon Inquisitor is a female dwarf archer rogue. Can you see that I have a type? So it's kind of the same thing. I usually play a female character my first go around because I'm a woman. And a lot of games don't give you the option of playing a woman. So if I get that option, I'm going to darn well take it. Um, and my romance, <laughs> surprisingly enough, was still Aya. Um, if I had picked, um, someone else for my, uh, playthrough romance, I would be doing that, um, traveler. But it just so happens my canon romance is Aya. So, um, I had already saved, um, As you can see, I'd already done through all the gone through all the romances. This gap is because of Bash. I think there there was an issue with Bash, so I'm leaving an opening for when they fix that. Um, so. Uh, Okay. Here we go. There we go. Alright, this is actually what I want. Yes, it is. Okay. Just making sure. And there was some issues, um, apparently some of, um, the game wasn't recognizing whether you had kissed your love interest when you talked with them. Uh, so I just started um, just picking up with the uh, choice to kiss, which by default I had saved, I saved there anyway, and um, just kept going. But um, surprisingly it didn't show up with my Aya playthrough, but um, with others it did. So I just by default started there. Because it's not like it w there was a lot to play through there. 
and plus I get a smoochy character. Who's going to complain? Anywho, here we go. The late morning sun climbs high in the sky as I gaze out of the enormous window of the bedroom I've been given to use while we're here on Talaran. That is a pretty big bedroom. Everything is here is clean and fresh, the bed, the floors, even the air itself. The room has clearly been designed with comfort in mind, with plenty of cushions and throw blankets, plush slippers, and lush plants throughout. Um, are we enjoying it? Are we not? If I'm remembering correctly, I picked this. I'm enjoying this space. It's nice to have more than a few measly feet to move around in. This space makes my room on the ship seem like little more than a broom closet. A Talari host had urged us all to make ourselves at home, and I've certainly done so. Dropping down onto the circular sofa, I let myself breathe deep and relax. My room is situated high in the Issel Spire, not far from the top, which I've been told hosts an incredible rooftop garden. From the window, I can see across the vast expanse of the planet, green fields and blue waters both dazzling beneath the sunlight. Glints of silver can be seen in the distance, other spires scattered across the surface, housing the majority of the plant's planet's population. It truly is a sight to behold, and one I'm glad I've had the chance to experience. A notification goes off on my holopad, and when I project the screen, I see a new message pop up from the group chat Ayame has created to keep the crew in touch while we're here. Can you believe these rooms? They're ginormous! Eh, too fancy-pansy for my liking. If it's too much for you, Damon, I'm sure we can find a nice cardboard box for you to sleep in. Ha, sounds just like home. Yep, certainly sounds like Damon. I think the rooms are really nice, but does anyone know what the button on the side of the bed is for? Pleasure mode. Really? Stop teasing him, Bash. Ha 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 ha. It turns on the lights on the base of the bed. Oh, I don't think mine is working. Thanks anyway, Taylor. With a small laugh, I put my holopad away and smiled to myself. It must be nice for the crew to be able to relax for the first time in a long while, somewhere that they can feel safe. I know it's nice for me. Safe. At the thought of that word, my mind drifts to Nerissa. I'm going to take back our home together. I can hardly believe it. But then another thought hits me. Though I was born on Goldus and grew up running through the corridors of the palace in Siltavai, it never really felt like home. Maybe things would be different with Nerissa in charge. I feel more at home with the crew. The one thing I know for sure is that I need to talk to my sister. Uh, fuck. I don't remember what I said. I don't think it was this one. It was one of these two. Let's go with the, first, the second one. The one thing I know for sure is that I need to talk to my sister. Well, I'm happy she's here, that she's safe. I feel conflicted when I think of all the things she kept hidden from me. Nerissa must have had her reasons but for my peace of mind, I need to know them. Though it's only been a short month since I've been with the crew of the Andromeda Six, I can feel myself changing, and I'm not going to let my sister keep me in the dark ever again. An alert goes through the room and pulls me from my thoughts, and after pushing myself to my feet, I head over to check who's at the door. There's a panel on the inside of the room that shows who my guest is before I even open the door. With a smile, I hit the button to unlock it and greet him. Good morning, princess. Let's just take a moment to enjoy the design here. Must have been nice to be able to come up with just one sprite and not have to worry about expressions or anything like that. The bot stands in the doorway, unmovable, and if I didn't know him so well, I'd say more than a little intimidating. Come on, Kay, you know you can call me Taylor. Alright, Ben. Good morning, Taylor. I smile at KYL3, glad to see him. We'd had the chance to briefly reunite yesterday after we finished speaking with Nerissa, and I was glad to find him unharmed after the ordeal at the palace. On top of that, he had saved my sister and brought her here. I couldn't be more grateful. Good morning to you. What brings you here? I'm here to take you to Nerissa. Why didn't she come her, her, here herself? She had a few things to wrap up. I offered. I raise an eyebrow at him. It's so secret that there's been tension between my sister and I since we reunited. It has me wondering if she sent Kay to fetch me to avoid doing it herself. 
Shaking the thought from my mind, I glance over the bionic plates on KYL3's body and remember something else. My last conversation with Bash hadn't worried me, and I wonder if the bot in front of me might have any advice on the situation. Yeah, it was um, it was a scene that was added after I live streamed um, chapter six, but basically Bash um was really shaken by the confrontation with Ren, and he. He was really upset that for all the um, changes that have been made to him um, after his, uh, you know, with his bionic arm and eye and stuff, he, he was helpless. He couldn't do anything to protect the Traveler, especially a romance Traveler. And um, so he was talking about... Um, asking the Talarian doctors to mod him even more. Um, basically turn him into a bot like KYL3. And um, naturally the main character is, was really worried about that. And um, yeah, it, it's definitely something to be concerned about. Actually, I'm glad you're here. I was hoping I could talk to you about one of my friends, if we have the time. Of course. And um, on the live stream I just called him Kyle, but apparently he doesn't like that. So I'm just um, saying, I'm just spelling it out basically. We're just saying K. I make way for K to enter the room behind me. The two of us take a seat in the circular si sitting area across from each other. Well, I'll just get straight into it. His name is Bash. I start the discussion explaining my fears to Kay, who listens without interruption. It could be a little unnerving speaking to a being with no human reactions, gaining no sense of the thoughts and emotions that may be going through his head, but I manage it well enough. So he's not even like Data where he has some human expression, he's just entirely flat. So it's kind of like the physical version of just text messages. There's nothing to read into his reactions. I suppose after knowing Kay since I was a child, I'm used to it. To sum it all up, I'm worried about him. Really worried. Bash says he wants to replace parts of himself with bionics, but I can't help feeling like the decision is coming from the wrong place. Like he thinks he has no other choice but to reconstruct himself entirely, and he's afraid of what will happen if he doesn't. When I finish speaking, Kay says nothing for a long moment. Eventually, he sits forward and leans his elbows against his legs, looking at me through strange robotic eyes. On the inside, my software mimics the emotions of a human, but I'm reminded every day that I'll never truly be one of them. I can't feel the heat of the sun, or the cool sting of the wind, or the touch of another's hand. Sometimes I might pretend I do. Sometimes I even try to convince myself that it's true, but I know it's not. He goes quiet for a few moments while we sit. But somehow I know he hasn't finished speaking. I stay silent, my stomach dropping at the admission. To be perfectly honest, I had no idea that Kay felt this way, and I'm feeling a little guilty that I've never picked up on it before. Why would you have? He was Nerissa's companion, not yours. If I had the chance to feel all of that, I'd give anything for it. Your friend doesn't know what he's giving up. I let out a breath of relief, even as my heart breaks for the bot. KYL3 has always been a reasonable source of advice, and to know that he feels the same way I do about this matter lifts a weight off me. Do you think that maybe you could talk to him, or we could do it together? I think it would do him good to hear your point of view. I'd be happy to. Leaving my room with Kay, I find myself feeling a little better about this situation with Bash. Yeah, I was pretty upset um, last chapter too. I forget exactly why. I'd have to replay it again. Um, but, yeah, she needs some comfort, and I think she's gonna find that here in Talarn. I'm still worried that he's going to do something drastic, in fact, he already could have, but having an outside perspective from someone who intimately knows the other side of the coin could be just what Bash needs. Forgive me if I'm crossing the line, but is there no way to give you the sensations that you're missing, a technology that could do it? KYL3 shifts his head towards me slightly. 
VTBs aren't built for such things. We were built for war. To our creators, it was better not to feel anything at all. Well, that's annoying and kind of sad at the same time. The technology might be created, but I'd have nowhere for it to go. The inventor who set me free might have found a way. In fact, I'm sure he would have. He pauses for a long moment, his stride sure and unwavering. But he's long gone now. I'm sorry, Kay. Don't be. I can't complain about the life I live or the people in it. I follow his line of sight to the gazebo in the distance, spying the dark hair of my sister as she looks out across the water, her back turned to us. With Narissa in sight, I stop suddenly, hesitant to go any further. Kay takes a few steps before he realizes I'm no longer beside him. He turns back to me patiently, waiting for me to make a move. You knew the whole time about what she was planning? Yes, I helped her plan it. You didn't think to tell me? I encouraged Narissa to involve you, but she wouldn't have it. Understand, Taylor, that it wasn't because she didn't trust you. It was because she was afraid of what would happen if you knew. And maybe more afraid of what you would think of her. Um, I know I picked this one before, but I like this one better. I could have helped her. She should have known that I would have her back, that I could have helped her. I would have done whatever she asked of me. I know that, and I know she does too. He looks towards the gazebo, his voice quieter when he speaks again. I think that's what terrified her. They'd get hurt in the process. What Kay is saying makes sense in a way, but somehow I'm not sure I can find it in myself to forgive the deception so easily. I can tell the bot senses this by the way he places a heavy metallic hand on my shoulder, as though he would comfort me if he could. I know she doesn't show it, but Nurse is easily overwhelmed by her emotions. Her love for you blinds her. It makes her want to protect you, even when you don't need it. I think she saw in you the faces of all Celiota, projecting her thoughts and fears for them onto you. I glance at the figure of my sister in the distance, pacing beneath the vine-covered gazebo that looks out across an artificial lake. That's not good enough. Kay looks at me again, and I get the impression that he's smiling, despite the plates on his face never shifting. Talk to her. Tell her how you feel. It will make you feel better in the end. He leaves me with that, walking away while I glance towards the gazebo again, readying myself for the conversation I'm about to have with the only family I have left. Sucking in a breath, I head over and step into the shade, watching as Nerissa turns at the sound of me approaching. She smiles at me softly, but when I don't return the gesture, it slowly fades. You're upset with me. I can tell. I sigh out loud. She's always had a way of knowing what I'm feeling, and there's no use hiding that from her now. Just don't understand why you didn't tell me what was going on. I wanted to, believe me. There were many times when I almost let it slip, but I couldn't. I couldn't let you get involved, knowing how much danger it would put you in. I could have handled it. I know you want to keep me safe. Is that the only reason? Now, this is the one I picked on the live stream, and I'm going to pick it again. Are you sure that's the only reason? I stared at her firmly, attempting to pick out any hint of emotion in her face. I don't understand what you're asking. Did you want to keep me safe, or were you more worried about what I think of you? How do I react to the news of you overthrowing our father? Of course I worried what you'd think of me. I worried what everyone would think of me, but I was running out of options. I nod, even though her anger unnerves me. At least she's being honest this time. It takes only a second before she sighs softly and shakes her head. Our father needed to be removed from the throne, and I was willing to do it peacefully. With the help of Tajin and the Talari, we would have succeeded. I would never have incited the bloodbath that Jess Zovac caused. I think of our family, fighting for their lives, fighting for each other. Our father was a poor excuse for a king, but I... I... She stops and closes her eyes, stealing something inside herself before it shatters like glass. You loved him. Yes, in my own way. I tried to protect him in the end, but it wasn't enough. Her eyes go dark, her mind drifting somewhere far from here. I reach out and place a hand on her arm, and she returns it to me with a regretful smile. I'm sorry. Sometimes I get stuck in my memories of that night. I understand. It must have been awful. I'm sorry I left without saying anything. I'm not. If you hadn't le I left, I doubt that both of us would be here together today. That's very true. I can't tell you how thankful I am for that. 
Taking one of my hands, she squeezes my fingers tight. I have to admit that I'm glad she's here, despite everything. I can tell that she regrets how things have played out, that she didn't involve me in her plans. I can only hope that things will be different going forward. Suddenly I remember the gift she'd given me not long before we'd been separated. I reached into my pocket for the small trinket. I have something to show you. Oh, my music box. I hand the box over and she opens the lid with a smile. A soft tune spills out of it, the holographic ballerina dancing in the middle of the small sphere. It got broken the night I left the palace, but Damon had it fixed for me. That was a kind a gesture. She holds the music box up to her face, studying its intricacies closely. I've never shown you, but the music box is a secret. Look. There is a twisted sphere over, pressing two buttons on the side that pop open a hidden compartment on the bottom. She pulls out a ring, holding it in her palm for me to inspect. It's a golden signet ring, engraved with the Pegasi crest. She holds it out to me with an expectant look on her face. Here. Try it on. Um, I'm debating. I mean, it's it's more flavored text than anything. It changes. It adds a little when um, your love interest visits later. But, uh, I mean, I've done both options. Um, not necessarily with the same character, but as I've done my playthroughs. Um, so, no, we'll, we'll tell Marissa to keep it. You keep it. It wouldn't feel right for me to wear it. I mean, Marissa is the, um, heir. She is going to be grueling if all goes well. If you're sure? I am. Marissa looks saddened by my decision, but I feel this is the right one to make. I didn't feel like a Pegasi back on Goldus. I certainly don't feel like one now. I watch as she slips the ring onto her own finger, knowing that's where it belongs. Knowing that that's where it belongs. You've changed so much, little one. It's nice to see, but also a little surprising. It seems like the crew you've fallen in with have had an effect on you. Smile at the thought of them. The friendships I've made, the people I've grown close to, each of the crew has made an impact on me on, in one way or another. They have. Being with them has given me the chance to explore who I am away from the confines of royal life. I'm not sure I would have ever figured out who I truly am back on Goldus. Marissa nods. I get the impression that she wants to say more, but she holds herself back. For whatever reason, I can't quite tell. I look forward to getting to know them better, and this new you, too. She sighs as her gaze breaks away, looking out over the lake. I've been thinking a lot about the past, Taylor, how I don't want to make the same mistakes again. I say nothing, but I feel the weight of her words. Even though Vex had no choice in his deception of us, I trusted him too much. Perhaps I should be more careful in the future. Later, we'll be meeting to discuss what to do next. We're ready to make a move against Zovac. We only have to decide how to do it. I want you to be there. I want you to have a say. What about the crew? Yes, them too. With the crew involved, we'll have representatives from every planet. The decision belongs to all of us. She stops for a moment, looking me over with a quiet smile as she reaches out to take my hand. Taylor, when I take back the throne, you'll be my heir. Things will be different. I promise you that. Now, this is... 
Um, this is kind of important. Um, I don't know if it will probably have some impact on where the game goes. Um, but, um, obviously this one's like, sure, okay, and this one's like, nope, and this, and I wasn't sure about not, but I went ahead and picked it on one of my other playthroughs, and it's just you, just being like, we'll see. But, yeah, we're gonna just be like, what if I don't want that? What if I don't want to be your heir? Marissa drops my hand as she assesses me, and I know that wasn't the answer she expected to hear. I've seen so much of the system during my time on the A6. I started learning about how the people live and what they want for themselves. Marissa, you don't have to take the throne. We could let the planets govern themselves. In risk civil war amongst the system, you don't know that it'll be result in civil war. No, no, it's better this way. Better for all of us. Or better for you. But, she raised a hand to cut me off and I can see that she has herself convinced. But as for me, I'm not so sure that I want to be a part of this new structure. I can only hope that there's something more out there for me. With nothing more to say, I decide it's best to change the subject. Have you spoken to Vex? She hesitates before she answers, as though she's not sure she wants to talk about it at all. No, not yet. He's been taken to the hospital. They're trying to reverse whatever the doctor of Zovex has sent to him. Do you think they'll be able to help him? I'd be surprised if they couldn't. She smiles a little, I could tell she's trying to be encouraging, despite her personal feelings on the matter. Do you think you'll ever truly forgive him? Nurse purses her lips in thought, her violet eyes narrowing at memories of the past. Maybe. I don't know. I suppose I'll have to find a way. He truly believed that he'd killed you. It was tearing him apart. She swallows hard as she looks away, and I can see that she's torn. Her trust wasn't only broken, but ripped to shreds and thrown back in her face. I know well enough that it's not such an easy thing to forgive. Yeah, it's not quite the same as what happened between the Traveler and Vex. But yeah, she did trust him more than the Traveler, and look what happened. I better head off before it gets late, but I'll see you at the meeting later. I can tell that she's excusing herself before having to discuss the situation any longer, and I suppose I can't blame her. Just because I was able to forgive Vex doesn't mean I should expect her to do the same. Taylor? Now that you're here, we have everything we need to set our plans in motion. Everything will be all right. You'll see. She smiles at me and we say goodbye, though after Nurse leaves, I linger beneath the gazebo a little longer. We have everything we need to set our plans in motion. I have to admit, it feels good to be included, and I'm looking forward to what this meeting might bring. Later that day, I head towards the hangar that serves as a rebel camp and the meeting that awaits us all. Upon entering, I find that I'm the last to arrive, and I admit that I may have been distracted by the plant's natural growth that sprawls through the spire on my way down here. The Issel Spire and the planet itself is beautiful. I'm looking forward to having more time to explore the place, but for now, that will have to wait. The crew are already here, along with Eldred, Nerissa, and Kay. The hangar itself is quieter than usual, though I notice a few people flitting around in the background, making themselves scarce. Oppo towers over the group from the back, where they stand with Alyssa, Elisa and Zane, and I notice one other person that I've never seen before. All eyes are on me as I take a spot with the crew. Nerissa gives me a small smile, so I get the feeling that she may have expected me to stand by her side instead. I get it. I understand. But the crew are kind of becoming more of a family to me than even Nerissa. 
Welcome, Taylor. Sorry, am I late? Not at all. You're right on time. Eldred smiles at me kindly before he turns to address the group. I expect you all know why we've called this meeting. Jess Sovac sits on the throne of Goldus, posing as the savior of our system, though the reality is much darker. With a small wave of his hand, Eldred, Eldred stands back, steps back and Narissa takes the floor. Zovac uses fear of manipulation to control his followers and his reach is spreading. Every day, people are fighting for their freedom, losing and dying to his Khmeri soldiers. With Eldred's help, Kay and I have brought people here who are willing to help us make a final stand against Zovac and the Khmeri. Of course I did nothing. Who is this? I like. Oh, alright. I suppose you helped a little. Nurse smiles at the stranger I noticed earlier. The two of them seem familiar with each other. For those who don't know, this is Kadara Sudras. They've been a leader among the Catalfans for some time now, and with his help, we've brought many of them here. So, they and his. So, and it was confirmed by the developers that those are his pronouns. They, him. So, um, yeah. Either works. And he's a Catalfan, because you can tell from the marks on his neck. Those are gills for people who are unaware. I look over Kadar curiously, noticing the bow, noting the bow slung over their shoulder and the quiver of arrows on his back. Even on Tularan, a place that has seen nothing but peace, he seems ready for a fight. My people are looking to find a new home and begin a new life. They'll do what they have to to stop Zovac and make this dream a reality. His eyes seem to linger on me as he speaks, so I have no doubt they've noticed the scarred gills on my neck. Yeah, because uh, Taylor is a kid's Um, If you picked Talarin for uh, your traveler's race, then the opening scene has a few extra options. Because, of course, Talarin is your mother's home planet. They're people, the kid's Talfins. I suppose they're my people, too. I glance at Aya, wondering what she makes of this. The way she's smiling at Kadar's words tell me everything I need to know. Yeah, Aya is Catalpin as well. I think I mentioned that. And if you don't romance Aya, then you wonder if she has a crush. Well, that's all so inspiring. Aren't you forgetting something, Majesty? Elisa steps forward, her ma face a mask of indifference. What good does it do us to help you rip Zovac from the throne if it means we go back to suffering under the rule of yet another incapable Pegasi? I note the subtle clench of Nurse's jaw, but she brushes off the insult before me, addressing Elisa's claim. It wouldn't be like before, I give you my word. My goal is to correct the wrongs of my father, to find a way for the system to live in peace. Phew. <laughs> Pretty words from a pretty mouth. Sounds like we're getting the short end of the stick in this situation. Don't you think, Lisa? For once, I think you're right. Hey! Lisa ignores Jane's protest and I watch with growing dread as she squares up against my sister. I'll tell you what. Melissa, is it? Narissa. Whatever. Zane and I will help your little rebellion if you agree to sever Carissa from the crown once we've given Zoe back the boot. We want our independence, and one way or another, we're going to get it. No, absolutely not. No compromise, just flat out no. Great. Nurse's expression turns as hard as thunder, her resolve unwavering. If left to its own devices, Cursor would rip itself to shreds and no doubt take the rest of the system down with it. Uh, are you so sure about that? She obviously has no idea what's been going on on Kursa. Says you. I said no. The group around me are silent as stone, collectively holding their breath as we watch the two women stare each other down. Alright, Miss Double Standards, how about you telling the group what it cost you to recruit the help to Lauren while you when you were dying and desperate? Independence, isn't that right, Eldred? Eldred remained silent, his uh, expression given away nothing. That's different. Talarin will enter into a trusted partnership with the Crown. How could I expect Kursa to do the same? Elisa laughs, but there's no missing the fact that she's mocking my sister. If that's the case, perhaps we'll take our clans elsewhere. Perhaps you should. That's a lot of soldiers you'll be missing out on, love. Maybe have a think about reconsidering our generous offer. 
Jerusa looked to be on the verge of having Kay rip both the Christians' heads off, and the other two hardly seemed any happier. I feel as though I should say something before the situation gets any worse. I'd hate for things to turn violent. So, yeah, this was, um, that, this showdown between Nerissa and Elisa was where my stream, um, could put it on me, uh, briefly. So, I have yet to agree with Nerissa because I am on Elisa's side on this, in this matter. Uh, I may just do a throwaway save where I pick that option, but not, obviously not here. My throat seems to squeeze together as I take a step forward and all eyes turn on me, my hands starting to sweat at my sides. I agree with Elisa. I've seen Cursa and how the people are suffering. They should be given the chance to take control of their own lives, to speak for themselves. So they can rally another terrorist group and try to take the entire system? No, I don't think so. So, you're biased because Zovex group started out on Cursa. Why am I not surprised? What makes you think we want your squeaky clean golden city? All we want is to make our own decisions. You're willing to give to Lauren their independence, but not Cursa or any other planet for that matter. How is that fair? It's called a monarchy. It's how we've lived for the past thousand years. And look how well that's worked for everyone. Maybe it's time for a change and more than just you taking over. Things can change. Things should change. Yeah, exactly what I just said. <laughs> Nerissa sighs. I can tell that she doesn't want to argue with me, especially in front of the others, but I'm not about to give her a choice. I understand your passion, Taylor, but you're young. The world doesn't always work in the ways we want it to. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Taking a step back, I recoil at her words. Nerissa invited me to this meeting to have a say in what happens next, but it seems she's not willing to listen to any of us. I have to admit this is how that stinks. I thought we were closer than that. With all due respect, it's not fair for you to judge Taylor like that. She's been through more than you know. Calderon appears beside me, his formidable presence bolstering my confidence. If I wanted your opinion on the matter, Captain, I would have asked for it. You wanted my opinion, and whether you like it or not, this is it. Boom. Thankfully, my voice keeps steady as I speak, but the hurt is still there. We are thankful for it, Taylor, but we seem to be getting nowhere. I trust the parties involved can come to some sort of arrangement. In private, perhaps. Eldridge gives us all a severe look. The leader and him taking charge of the situation. Eldred. Why am I saying Eldridge? Eldred. I would remind you, Nerissa, that we need all the help we can get. Elisa and Zane not in agreement with Nerissa reluctantly following suit. Right, let's get into the real plans, shall we? We've got nothing to fight about if we can't even get past the usurper first. Exactly. Kadar takes center stage while the others retreat to quietly simmer in the background. Are we ever going to see him without his mask? Our army is big, but Zovax is bigger. The best way to approach this would be with smaller tactical attacks. Take out the key players one by one, then when their armor is cracking, cut off the head of the snake. If our army is smaller than Zovax, then what about the recruiting from the rest of the system? There are others who might want to help us. Bash speaks up for the first time, and I'm able to get a good look at him, noting that nothing has changed since the last time we spoke. Phew! We can't risk Zovac finding out our plans. There are spies all over, people who might report back to him. Zovac already knows we're here. He knows we're planning to move against him. Like Eldred said, the more support we have, the better. Kadar thinks it over for a moment, and even I have to admit that Bash's suggestion makes sense. It could serve as a diversion. He'll be focused on the bulk of our army rather than our tactical units. You're right, I can see that working. Oppo has contacts all across Terranium. They can get in touch with them to put the word out. You want Oppo to help? That's why you're here, isn't it? Oppo gulps and while I'm quite fond of the Arknos, I find it hard to believe that fighting in a rebel army was their, is their idea of a good time. Technically, Oppo is here because Miss Alyssa for Lisa forced them on a ship and brought them here. 
I'll help you out, Oppo. How about we get some of the old gang back together, huh? Oppo still seems reluctant, but they nod at the offer of help nonetheless. Calderon, Ayame, do you think you could sway any members of the guard to her side? I'm not sure. The guard was one of the first institutions to be corrupted by Zovax. Many of the soldiers had been replaced with his spies. We could at least try, Cal. We had friends on the guard, even if not all of them were real. They might be willing to help, but in fact, I can name a few who would jump at the chance. I suppose it's worth a shot. Though Calderon seems less than optimistic, Aya looks pleased to have been assigned the task. I have to admit that I am too. It will keep her busy and with any luck, it might also help to boost her confidence. Yeah, she was really shaken up by um, the confrontation with Ren. Kadar has the loyalty of many Catalpans. We'll have the majority of them on our side. I would hope so, but don't forget that Zovac himself is part Catalpan. He'll try to use that to his advantage. Wait, Zovac is Catalpan? I mean, we've been sheltered, so it makes sense that we don't know this shit. Only partly, but it might be enough to sway a few Catalpans to his side. He hasn't managed to use his Solari roofs to his advantage, so let's hope for our sake so the Catalpans are able to see right through him. Tularin and Catalpin. Oh boy. Throw a look at Nerissa. Tulari roots? Before I could ask for anything, the conversation continues. We need to act quickly. Once we have our people together, we'll have to decide on the next step. Next to Zovac himself, Ren is the most important target. They have the loyalty of his soldiers. With Ren out of the way, their allegiance will falter. How can you be so sure? It's true. I've seen it myself. Vex speaks up, but I have to admit that it's right to see him here. Last I heard, he was being taken care of by the Tulari at the hospital. Zovac's soldiers are loyal, but they'll be reluctant to take orders from anyone but Ren. Vex worked with Ren personally. He'll be a valuable source of information if you're planning to take them out. One second. I'm like, not even hearing any music. There we go. Damon also knows the inner working of the Khmeri, don't you, Reznor? Not enough to be of any help. Any information helps. That's fair. Vex and Damon, was it? If you'll share what you know, I'm sure we can put it to good use. The two men nod before melting back into the group again. After Ren, we go for the doctor. He controls the Orionite Ori 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 soldiers. There we go. Without him, they'll be in disarray, easier to pick up. I wouldn't be so sure about that. June speaks hesitantly, but loud enough for us all to hear. What do you know about them? My parents created them. They created me. Kadar pauses, his expression softening as the realization comes over him. How can you tell with that mask? Would you help us put together a plan to take them out? I'll do what I can to help, provided Riona assists me. She's studied my condition intimately. Her help would be invaluable. Kadar nods in a glance around for Riona, finding her once again hidden in the back. It's clear by her expression that this is the last place she wants to be. I suppose I can't blame her for that. Make a note to check in with her after the meeting. When it comes to it, my crew can take care of Ren. Just tell us where to find them. It won't be easy. Ren is surrounded by soldiers at all times. You'll have to go through more than a few Khmeri to get to them. Cal looks around the group, his gaze picking out his crew. Every last one of us not in confirmation of his silent, to his silent request. We're up to the task. We'll get it done. Kadar gives him a nod, having understood what just transpired between us all. Last we heard, they returned to Gold this after your attack on Orion. I expect they'll stay there until Sovak sends them out again. Goldus it is, then. It's been a long time. Aya puts a hand on Calderon's, Calderon's arm in comfort, and I know that they both understand what it means to return to Goldus. So we're going full circle. We start out leaving Goldus. We're going to return to Goldus. But we're gonna have to anyway. As for myself, I haven't been back there since the attack on the palace. I share Calderon's hesitance. I have to admit that I share Calderon's hesitance. The gold is might be my home planet. My memories of the place are less than fond. The thought of returning there is one that sends a shiver of doubt down my spine. Nerissa, you need to be the one to confront Zovac. The people need to see you. 
Taylor can come with me. We'll do it together. No, I'm going with the crew. Marissa faltered at my declaration. I could see on her face that she wasn't expecting me to refuse. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Glance at the crew of the Andromeda Six. The people have become my closest friends, and I know without a shadow of a doubt that this mission is one we must do together. What would they do without their navigator? I only giggles as I wink at her, her smile bright enough to light up the entire room. I try to ignore Zarissa's pout. This decision is my own, and whether she likes it or not, she have to accept that. Can't just give orders and expect everyone to agree with them. Eldred and the Tulare will continue to provide shelter and aid to those who need it. We'll need a, a few days to get everything in order. I suggest between planning you all get some rest. And prepare yourselves. None of this will be easy, but we must win. Whatever the cost. I don't like the sound of that. The crew is quiet as we leave the meeting, and as each of them goes their own separate way, I hang around in the hangar a little longer. While I'm eager to speak to the crew, it was a lot of information we just took in, and I can't blame them for needing some time to process it. Heading up to the elevators, I take a moment to lean against the railing of the platform and look out over the tents of the ta soldiers of the equipment. This cause means as much to these rebel soldiers as any of us. This is the chance for them to take down a king who rules through terror and live a life of safety and peace. I want to help them do that. In fact, I would say that I need to. Apo has never seen so many different people come together before. I turn at the sound of the Arknos approaching, smiling as they join me against the railing. And now the androgynous crew is here too. Apo is happy. Androgynous. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they do it on purpose or not, but it's hilarious. Yeah? Even though Elisa forced you to come here? Apple smiles sheepishly, their forked tongue slipping between their teeth and hissing softly. The truth is, Apple could never have stayed behind and let their friends fight alone. Stronger together, that's what Apple thinks anyway. You're right, Apple. We are stronger together. I'm glad you're here. I think back to the argument between Arissa and the Curses, how the tension had come to a breaking point. It's clear that while not everyone is going to get along, we need each other if we're going to get through this. Our things with the Ark, I overheard you worrying about it during Elisa's call with Calderon and Aya. Apo's face drops, their shoulders drooping as they turn their head away. It's clear that they're homesick. Apo's friend is taking care of things. A very nice Ark knows Apo has known since they were young. Um. Pretty sure that's the uh, character that you play in Tea Time with Oppo. Or at least a relative of that character. But um, Oppo misses their home. I hope we can all get this over with so you can go home quickly. Maybe I'll come and visit you? Oppo would like that very much, and Oppo will also visit Miss Taylor at her home. Oh, where will that be? Goldis with Nerissa or the A6 crew? I don't know yet. Um, with the crew, hopefully. Depending on what happens with Aya, obviously. I hope to stay with the crew. They feel like home to me. I think of the crew, the friends I've grown so close to. Wherever they are, that will be my home. Wherever Taylor makes their home, Oppo will be happy to visit. Thank you, Oppo. I'm looking forward to it. The Arknos gives me a final nod before heading off, hopefully to find Bash and get started on reaching out to their contacts. I'm glad that the two of them will have something to keep them busy while we're here. Deciding to also move on, I take an elevator up to the main lobby of the spire, the lake that extends throughout the level, hoping it might be a calm place to collect my thoughts. As I exit the elevator, I notice a familiar figure standing on the water's edge, her silver hair cascading down her back as she stares out through across the lake. When I first played this, I thought it was supposed to be Aya. I don't know why. Riona? Oh! Excuse me, Taylor. I was lost in thought. That's okay. If you'd rather be on your own, I can leave. No, you're not disturbing me. I'm glad you're here. I step up next to her as she stares wistfully at the lake, the two of us admiring it side by side. It must bring back a lot of memories, being here. Riona's face falls. I had meant the comment in a positive light, but by her reaction, I'd say she's thinking quite the opposite. 
I have many fond memories of growing up here, swimming in the lakes and waterfalls with my sisters, going to school, but mostly I'm just reminded of my final days, the ones that were less than happy. She sighs deeply, hesitating, and I give her a moment to quietly collect her thoughts. I left to learn because I wanted to help the people of Celiota, while my father was content to hide here and do nothing. He told me that the other planets were responsible for cleaning up after themselves. I disagreed. Too many innocent people were suffering because of the messes that those more powerful than them had created. My mother and sisters were happy to follow his lead and ignore the world outside our planet. I couldn't sit back and watch. I refused. She stopped suddenly, and when I look at her, I see the shimmer of sparkling tears building in her bright eyes. That's why I joined the Archangels, but leaving this place, my family and my home, it was a hard thing to do. Do you wish you had stayed? She tilts her head to one side, considering the question thoughtfully. No, I don't think so. I don't regret leaving. The only thing I regret is how it all happened. You make it sound as though you escaped the palace in the middle of the night. In truth, I did. I told you how my friend was leaving to join Mila on Terranium and meet up with the Archangels. I decided to tag along, and together we took a vessel and left. She closes her eyes tight, as though the memories of that time are too painful to bear. I decided it might be best to change the subject. Things with the Archangels had ended in tragedy. I don't want to force her to relieve, relive it. Eldred seems to have changed his mind about helping the system now. Yes, I'm glad for it, but I don't understand why he's suddenly deciding to help. He seems to have struck some kind of deal with your sister. Perhaps that was his motivation. You could ask him? I don't know. I'm not sure that I'm ready. Um... Yeah, it's your decision. Because that's what this whole thing is about, is people deciding for themselves and not having someone else decide for them. And that's the crux of the problem with Nereza. You should do what you think is right. The decision is yours alone. Thank you, Taylor. I'm glad you understand. Family isn't always easy. I take a deep breath, thinking back to my conversation with Nerissa earlier. You can say that again. Speaking of, are your mother and sisters here in the Spire? From what I've heard, they're across the planet, at the university. My mother gives medical lectures there often, and I've been told my older sister, Anastasia, has recently finished her studies. And your other sister? Anthony? She's what you would call a bit... wild. Brianna chuckles to herself quietly, distant memories gleaming in her eyes. I expect she was looking for a change of scenery, somewhere new where she could shake things up. She sounds like fun. She is, very much so. Though I have to admit that I'm relieved. Facing my father is one thing, but having to face my entire family... She shakes her head gently, as though envisioning that very meeting in her mind. In this case, I think small steps will be best. I need to take some time to process this all before I speak to him. Nodding my head, I glance at the lake once more, admiring how the sunlight shines on the surface. That's understandable. Truthfully, I just want to check in on you and see how you're feeling after the meeting. It was a lot to take in. For all of us, I'm sure. But I'm glad that something is being done and that people are willing to fight for the life they deserve. Riona hesitates, and I get the impression she's having a hard time meeting my eyes, though I can't tell why. Though I have to admit, I'm afraid. Afraid of what? I... I... I'm afraid of myself, of what I might do if it comes to battle. If it comes to a battle, and I have to protect the people I love. Since you are a part of the crew, you should know what I've done. I stare at Riona, confusion clouding me. What does she mean by what she's done? I'm listening. I told you how the Khmeri slaughtered the Archangels and how I eventually found refuge at the Ark, where Bash found me. But I haven't told you everything. She looks away, something crossing her face that looks a lot like shame. Oh no, what did she do? The truth is, after the initial shock of watching my friend's thigh had worn off, something came over me. A kind of darkness that I can hardly explain. I tracked down those Khmeri. No, hunted might be a better word for what I did. A group of them were staying at a local bunkhouse, 15 altogether. They'd been out drinking, celebrating their victory, the murder of the Archangels. 
Fiona hiccups quietly, tears dancing in the corners of her eyes before they begin to fall, streaming over luminescent skin. I took one of their guns while they were all either passed out or sleeping, and I shot every single one of them. Most of them didn't even wake, but the others, when they woke, terrified and confused, I took pleasure in shooting them again. I feel the horror growing inside me, though I hope for Riona's sake it doesn't show on my face. Yeah, that's awful. But considering that she watched them kill her friends and her lover in front of her, yeah, I can understand. When they were all dead, I stumbled out of there, numb, losing myself in the crowds of geranium. I didn't stop walking until I ended up in front of the ark, and something deep inside me knew that was where I, that, that was where I was supposed to be. She takes in a deep breath to calm herself, though I see the way her hands shake as she relives these horrific moments from her past. Bash found me soon after, covered in blood. It took a while for him to get the truth out of me, and once he had, he didn't, hes didn't hesitate to help. So he introduced me to Calderon, who brought me into the crew as a medic, and that's where I've been ever since. She looks away quickly, bringing her long fingers together while glistening tears still linger on her cheeks. Okay, now that's a little too loud. There we go. Fifteen. I still see their faces, each and every one, even standing here right now. I'm glad Bash found you. I'm glad to hear that Bash was the one who found you. Who knows what might have happened if he hadn't. Brianna smiles slightly, and after the tears, it's a refreshing sight. I'd hate to think of it, but I'm glad he found me too. He's been a loyal friend since that day. I have much to thank him for. You could be more than friends. Forgive me if I'm crossing the line, but have you ever thought about him as more than a friend? Because I'm pretty sure he has a fairly heavy crush on you. <laughs> Her face. <laughs> I blush. Rose cheeks flush with color, a small sound escaping her. Yeah, so if you want to encourage her to actually consider a relationship with Bash, you have to pick the option saying that you're happy that Bash found her. But if you don't care one way or the other, pick one of the other options. I don't know. I haven't thought about it too much. But I suppose... She stops herself abruptly, her eyes going wide. Never mind. By the way she drops her gaze, I can tell that she's embarrassed, so I decide to drop the subject. For now, I have to ask. There are members of the crew who have killed and who have no issue with it. Does it bother you to be around that? No, it's not as simple as all that. She swallows, turning away towards the lake, as though the water might give her strength. I regret killing those Khmeri soldiers, but it's not the part that bothers me the most. What bothers me is how much I enjoyed it. How sickeningly happy I was to know those soldiers were dead, despite knowing it would never bring my friends or Mila back. And this anger, it's like an infection, slowly spreading through me. I tried to keep it hidden. All these months I've dedicated myself to healing and helping others, but I still feel it. Deep down, I'm so angry, and I'm so afraid of myself. It's against the Talari's nature to hurt others, yet I killed those soldiers without a thought. I've disgraced myself. No, don't cry some more! And I'm scared that I might do it again. Riona breaks down, the tears streaming once more, falling from the tip of her nose and disappearing into the lake. I give her some space, hoping she knows she can safely let out all her emotions without judgment. If you're romancing her, you can hug her, and she needs it. I can't tell you what will or won't happen in the future, but I know you, Riona. The soldiers who killed the Archangels were bad people. Think of how many more they might have hurt if you hadn't put a stop to it. You have a heart that's bigger than anyone I've met. I think that somehow you need to find a way to forgive yourself. I can't. I can't. Hey! way to uh jump in there <laughs> i was just talking to kadar isn't he great 
I almost get up to us happily, and I realized with a start that I must have been so engrossed in my conversation with Riona that I hadn't even heard her approach. Um, I, uh, I can't believe all the amazing work they've been doing with the Catalpins. I had no idea. Riona clears her throat quietly. Will you excuse me? Yes, of course. As Riona leaves, Aya's face falls, suddenly realizing the extent of her intrusion. Oh, shit, I interrupted something, didn't I? Me and my big mouth. It's okay, Riona's just dealing with some stuff, being back on Talarin and all. Aya slaps a hand to her forehead, squeezing her eyes shut and groaning out loud. Of course she is, I should have thought of that. I'm sorry, Taylor, I'll try and talk to her later. I might be able to find a way to cheer her up. I'm sure she'd appreciate that. Knowing that Aya is no doubt beating herself up for the interruption, I raise an eyebrow in her direction. Kadar, huh? So this is slightly different if you don't romance Aya. So, Kadar, huh? Should I be jealous? Aya chuckles lightly, reaching out to take me by the hand and pull me close. Not one bit. Kadar is cool, but he's got nothing on you. Glad to hear it. Seems like you're feeling better. I think I am a bit. Hearing about Kadar's work is exciting. She gives me a big smile and it helps relieve some of the worry I've been carrying for her. Yeah, if you tease her about Kadar when you don't romance her, she teases you right back about whoever you're romancing. I love Aya so much. There are people out there fighting to find a new home for Catalpins. I hope I can help, even in some small way. I want to be able to make a difference in their lives. Uh, I don't remember what I said before. How would you help? What do you think you'd help them? Aya looks off to the side, her gaze trailing in the sunlit water. I'm not sure yet, but Kadar will have some ideas. I don't mind what I do, really, whether it's helping with getting supplies or building homes or even piloting ships to get people there. Every little bit helps. Well, that's what Kadar says, anyway. All of a sudden, she sighs, her shoulders slumping in unison. Probably seems silly to think about now, with everything else we're going through. I don't think it's silly. We all have to think about the future at some point. Yeah, I guess you're right. I know we'll never replace Catalpa, but maybe we could find somewhere else to call home. Somewhere nice. And preferably on a beach. That sounds amazing. Count me in, because that sounds amazing. Yeah, if you suggest Goldish, she's like, hell to the no. She was not happy on Goldish. She was just there because it was her only option. I'd love to live on a beach, soak in the sun every day, listening to the waves crashing at night. Now you're talking, we could have a little beach shack of our own one day. Be careful, because I might just hold you to that. I hope you do. What a life that would be, right? Though, I have to admit, I'd miss the sky. There's nothing like shooting through space with the ship completely in your control. She smiles to herself wistfully. Having experienced I as flying for myself, I'm not so sure if I find it more exciting or terrifying. Ah. Uh, in this case, I'm leaning towards exciting. You know, if I had one wish, it would be for Catalpa to be alive and well. But since that will never happen, I'll solve for hoping that us Catalpins can find somewhere new to call home. Wherever that might be. And maybe you'll come with us? I could teach you all about the food and the culture, things you might not have known in the palace. I haven't thought much about my future yet, but if it looks anything like that, I know it'll be amazing. Reaching out, I push aside a strand of hair from her face, smiling at her softly and falling deep into those violet eyes. That's a good dream, Aya. If there's anything I can do to help, all you have to do is ask. Thanks, Taylor. I knew I could count on you. With a final excited giggle, Aya may leaves, and I find myself smiling after her. Things have been rough for her since Orion, but it seems now that she's finally starting to find some positivity in her thoughts of the future. With a small sigh, I look out over the lake, deciding what to do next. So apparently you can do all of these. Um. Oh. Huh. Uh, da 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 da. I'm trying to remember what I picked and what order. I suppose it doesn't really matter. So let's head to the rebel camp. I mean, I just came from there, but might as well. 
Decided on checking out the spire's ground floor now that I had some time to myself, I head towards the elevator. I didn't exactly have a chance to look around. The metal and glass box shoots downwards at a speed that would be terrifying if I didn't trust the Talari's prowess with technology. Mere seconds pass before the elevator delivers me into the enormous open space that once was, was once an aircraft hangar and now serves as a rebel camp. I spot Calderon leaning on the railing right away, his back to me as he looks out over the various tents and people that occupy the space. I can tell he hasn't noticed me, so I stay silent, creeping up behind him. What are you looking at? Uh, nothing. <laughs> I don't believe you. I glance over the railing towards where the captain was looking, spying Narissa speaking with a few people below. Pulling back, I managed to smother my laughter, giving Calderon a knowing grin instead. She's beautiful, don't you think? I don't know why, but I did not pick up on the fact that he might be interested in Narissa at the end of the previous chapter. Calburn rubs at the back of his head nervously, his face flushing a deep crimson. I haven't noticed. Uh-huh. Sure you haven't. Alright, that's enough of that. Don't you have anything better to do other than tease me? You should talk to her. You should try go and talk to her. And say what? Oh, I don't know. How's your day going? Is there anything I can help you with? I'd really like to kiss you now. You're treading on thin ice. Stow away. Oh, hey, Narissa. What? He spins around, eyes going wide, and I burst out laughing at the empty face behind him. When he turns back, he narrows his eyes at me, grumbling quietly. Very funny. I laugh a little. It's only now that I've noticed we're collecting more than a few curious stares. People are looking at us. No, people are looking at you. Me? Why? Cal shrugs, leaning his forearms against the railing as he looks out over the space. Because you're one of two surviving Pegasi? Something like that makes people curious. It's making me uncomfortable. It's kind of making me uncomfortable. I'm not used to the attention. We can find somewhere else to talk, if you like. I look around at the various faces splitting between tents and stations. A few of them look away quickly when our eyes meet, but a lot of them smile up at me, and some even wave in greeting. It makes me feel a little better. No, it's okay. I suppose it's something I'll have to get used to. Yeah, you're still the youngest, but now you're the youngest of two. It's not... being overlooked is not gonna happen. Cal nods his head, and something about the gesture makes me think he understands. It's not so bad being in the spotlight. I find that people tend to listen to you if you have something to say, that is, which you certainly did during the meeting. Yeah, I wanted to say my piece, though Narissa was less than thrilled about it. Thank you for sticking up for me, by the way. I'm sure it can't have been easy since you've got a big ol' crush on her. He rolls his eyes at me, I smirk, but I don't miss the color that flushes his cheeks. You're impossible. Relax, I think it's cute. Give him a small nudge on the arm, earning a grumble of mixed sounds in re response. Well, anyway, who is nothing? I'll always put my crew first. I hope you know that. I smile at him and nod my acknowledgement. At least that much is clear by now. You must be happy to have your sister back. I know I should be. I mean, I am. Really. I wish she would have told me about all of this earlier, but I suppose I can't change that now. Nope, certainly not. She's a leader. Sometimes they have to make choices they don't want to. I know how that feels. Would you have done the same thing if you were in her position? I don't know. Maybe. Cal sighs heavily, his hand going to the back of his head, and a guest can only describe his hesitance. You don't have to forgive her, but it can't hurt. At the very least, it might help to lift some of the weight off your own shoulders. I nod slowly as I think it over, and eventually I shrug. I can see where he's coming from. I suppose you're right. I'm always right. <laughs> he chuckles quietly to himself and I scowl at him softly for laughing at me. What's so funny? You, or rather how different you are to when I first met you. Just a lost little stowaway who had stumbled onto my ship. Yeah, yeah, I remember. I'm starting to figure out who you are and I'll admit, I'm proud of you. Thanks, Captain. Never thought I'd hear that from you. He smiles warmly as I tease him, and as I look out over the tops of the tents, I think back to our meeting here earlier. So, it sounds like we'll be heading back to Goldis. Are you ready to see your home again? 
considering the last two times I was there were complete a complete shit show? Not so much. Don't you want to see your parents? His face falls and gets the impression that being parted from his mom's has had a bigger impact on him than he lets on. It's too risky to contact them, at least until we've finished off Zobek. But I'll admit, I'm worried about them. Floor had ties to the palace, and Janine owns a restaurant in the Gold District. I've managed to find out that they've escaped the city, but with that bastard on the throne, I don't know how long anyone will stay safe. Where did they go? I don't know for sure. There's people out there who would try to use them against me, maybe to draw myself and the crew back to Goldis. Well, that's gonna happen anyway. It's best that wherever they are, they stay hidden. I smile at him sadly, conveying as best I can how sorry I am that he's had to be separated from his family for so long. With any luck, we'll be able to remedy that. Do you have, think we have a chance against Sovac? The question comes out before I can stop it. Once I've spoken, I realize that I really am interested to hear his answer. Cal stays quiet for a good long moment before he speaks. If you asked me that a week ago, I would have told you our chances were slim, but now... Yeah, I think we might be able to do it. I take in a deep breath, thinking of the other obstacle that stands in our way. And Bren, we have to get through them first. It won't be like it was on Orion, I promise you that. He must sense my uncertainty because he puts a hand on my shoulder and smiles softly. This time, we'll be ready for them. We share a look and I know that he means it. We won't be caught off guard again, and if Bren is what stands in the way of us taking down Sovax, then we'll do what we have to. Yeah, on Orion, we were not prepared for someone like Ren to show up. But he is this time, we are going after Ren, so we know what to expect. I'm going to head down and talk to some of the soldiers. Do you want to come with me? No, I think I'll leave you to it. Say hi to Nerissa for me. I'm going to leave before I throttle you. I chuckle quietly while Cal stomps off, leaving me on my own to decide what to do next. Um, let's walk around the lake. I glance out over the lake, so beautiful and still, as it dazzles in the sunshine. I don't want to leave it just yet. Okay, if it's supposed to be in the sunshine, why is it dark? That's what confuses me. Instead, I walk around the water's edge, taking in the beauty of the spire. People pass by me, usually to Lari, but there are a few of the rebels here and there. They offer me smiles, so I don't miss the looks so they shoot each other, or the whispers they exchange once I believe they're out of earshot. A little way further, I come across a familiar trio standing together in a small grassy area, beneath the shade of a rather impressive willow tree. Damon is first to look up as I approach, the frown on his face apparent as he cuts his conversation with Elisa and Zane short. Well, well, look who it is. Fancy seeing you here. Didn't think you were the one to be out enjoying the sun. You seem more like the dark and shadowy type. There's a lot you don't know about me, princess. I give both Elisa and Zane a nod and greeting, and they smile at me warmly. Of course, they're happy with me. You're talking about the meeting? We sure are. By the way, thanks for the backup. It's nice to see not all the Pagasi are power-hungry money grabbers. Glad I was proved wrong for once. Good one, Lisa. You just insulted her sister. Oh, and her deceased family. Someone had to do it. Elisa gives Damon a smug smile while he shakes his head at her in disapproval. Let's play nice, eh, honeybee? Plenty of people here who can help us get what we want, including this one. Zane indicates to me with a nod, but Elisa, Elisa simply scowls at him. I told you not to call me that in public. Honeybee? Ugh, you two are gross. You're gross. Real mature, Elisa. Elisa makes a face at Damon, earning an obscene hand gesture in response, but the two of them only end up laughing. Yep, definitely have a history together. It's nice to see that despite everything that's happening, their friendship is still as strong as ever. I get the feeling that we're all going to need our friends before the end. Hey, Elisa, I just wanted to say, while I can never fully imagine what you and the other Christians have been through, I do understand your anger. I take in a deep breath while Elisa stares me down. She's intimidating, that's for sure, but I want you to know that I'm on her side. You came here to make things better for your planet, and you were turned down flat. You know how it feels to be helpless. I also know my sister. I think she'll come around. Don't give up. I never do. With her hands in her pockets, Elisa steps up to me. She's a small woman, but that doesn't make her presence any less imposing. You're alright, Taylor. I hope we can be friends. I hope so, too. Turning back to the two men, she indicates the thing with a nod of her head, her copper hair falling around her shoulders as she does so. 
Sing, let's give them some time alone. We should track down the so-called rebel leaders and discuss a few things. With a small wave goodbye, Elisa heads off, Zane slowly making a move to follow. See you later, Resner. He winks at Damon as he leaves, chuckling to himself quietly about something only he seems to know. <laughs> um, obviously this is not the question you get if you're a romance, Damon. See? Um, am I wrong or was he just flirting with you? I turned to Damon, knowing the look of annoyance on his face, so I don't miss the subtle flush of color that stains his cheeks. Who knows? The guy's a clown. He shoves his hands into his pockets, uncharacteristically setting the ground at his feet. So, him and Elisa are... a thing. Yeah, it's weird. I know. It's not so weird. I think they suit each other. I'm sure he doesn't get along. He's only going to benefit Cursa. <laughs> I can tell she's enjoying having him follow her around like a lost little puppy in any case. As long as she's happy, I suppose. I shake my head at him, but smile nonetheless. I'm not sure what's going on with him, but I'll admit that it's intriguing. She's your best friend. That should be all that matters. Damon chuckles softly, the annoyance casually slipping from his face to reveal a smile. Look at you being all wise and shit. You're right, but don't let that go to your head. He leans back against the trunk of the tree, his trailing leaves swaying softly between us. There's a slight breeze in the air, though with us being surrounded by the glass walls of the spire on all sides, I suppose it must be artificial. Do you think they'll settle on some kind of agreement with Narissa? I watch Damon as he thinks it over, his chin scrunching with distaste. I think they'll have to. It's pretty clear that th in this situation that neither side is going to get what they want on their terms. Shit, I want Krista to have its independence as much as Lisa, but old Queenie's not wrong to have her doubts. All I know is that none of us are taking down Zovac alone. That's what we should focus on. The rest can wait. I think you're right. Of course I am. I roll my eyes at him, though he simply chuckles in response. It doesn't take long before his face falls again. Okay, I'll be right back. I need to take care of something. I won't need to take another break. So, we're finally heading to Goldus. That'll be interesting. What do you mean? Zovac ain't dumb. He knows we're planning something. How we'll manage to get past his guard, I don't know. <laughs> I love your optimism. Do you have any ideas? Do you have any ideas on how we can get to him? You've worked with him before. Surely your inside knowledge could benefit us. Damon nods, so he doesn't look proud of the fact. I might have one or two. Kadar will meet with me and Carrot Head tomorrow, and we'll go over some things then. I hope the three of you can come up with something, or else I guess we're screwed. Damon shoves his hands in his pocket, a strange expression coming over his face. I didn't mean to worry you about Zovac. No matter what, we'll give this our best shot, me included. I know, it's just. We've already lost one family. I don't want to lose another. Aww. I'll do everything I can to make sure that doesn't happen. This is my family too, remember? I thought you'd never admit that out loud. Yeah, well, I guess the situation's made me all mushy and shit. 
We share a smile and it occurs to me how much he really has changed these last few weeks. I no longer see the Damon who thought purely of his own desires, using cruelty and recklessness to achieve his ends. While I have no doubt he's still in there somewhere, I feel fortunate that he feels comfortable enough to let his guard down around me. To show me the kind of man that he truly wants to be. I like you like this. I got out the words before I could stop myself, but I don't regret them. Damon breathes out a laugh, seeming taken aback by the admission. Yeah? Something about soft, something soft crosses onto his face, his head tilting thoughtfully. I like me like this too. We let the moment linger a little longer, and I know now, without a shadow of a doubt, that Damon is truly a friend that I can count on. He clears his throat finally, his gaze shifting back to the sharp mask I've grown to know all too well. I'd better catch up to Lisa and Zane. There's more to talk about where Kurtz is concerned, and I want to be involved. For the first time that I can remember, Damon seems almost unsure of himself. You should be. Go. Damon heads off, giving me one last nod before he does, and I decide what to do next. Um, yeah, I didn't mention this before, but, um, if you return to your room, that's it. So if you want to have all the conversations, um, save going to your room for last. Go to the gazebo. Spying the gazebo across the lake, I decide to spend some time there and join the peace. But when I approach the quiet spot, I find it's already occupied. Hey June, sorry, am I interrupting anything? Lizzie! June smiles and reaches up to give Lizzie a pat and sits on his shoulders contentedly. No, not at all. Lizzie and I are just taking in the sights. Do you want to join us? Sure, why not? I take a seat on the bench next to June, noticing Lizzie watching me through black, beady eyes. You can pet him if you want. Oh, are you sure? Yeah, of course. June spits Lizzie down on the bench between us, and immediately the lizard turns to blink up at me curiously. Alright, Lizzie, play nice. Um, obviously we're gonna pet Lizzie. If you grow Miss June, you can pet Lizzie. And then Lizzie perches on your shoulders. It's really cute. Taking care to go slow, I reach out my hand towards Lizzie, letting him get used to it before I get closer. Lizzie closes his eyes, softly pushing his little head against my hand as I pet him. See that? He likes you! I smile as I stroke Lizzie's head and down his neck. His skin is rough in patches, but also quite soft. It's clear by the colors he sports, vibrant blue, green, and yellow, that he's well look at, looked after. Here you go, Lizzie. Good boy. June takes a few pellets from his pocket and sets them on the bench in front of Lizzie, who gobbles them up greedily. He then gives the lizard a soft scratch under the chin before Lizzie curls up on the bench and closes his eyes happily. So, what do you think of Talarin so far? June gestures with a hand to the lake and the large waterfall situated on one side of the enormous building. A monorail travels by in the distance, the sound of it almost completely drowned out by the water rushing down over the gigantic rock arch. Um, June is a little concerned if you say you're not impressed, but, um, this was the one I picked last time, and then I picked this one before, and it's so hilarious, I'm gonna pick it this time. Honestly, Riona had told me how beautiful the planet was, but I think it's even better than I expected. All the greenery and water is so soothing, and the simplest of their technologies is impressive. They look over at June, and by the way, he's smiling, I think he agrees. Even the people are nicer than I thought they'd be. They really are. I had a couple of Talari women follow me around all morning trying to offer me fruit and honeyed wine. So when they tried giving me a shoulder massage, I ended up having to give them the slip. They were very insistent. A sort of laughter escapes me. I think June may have misinterpreted the kindness of these particular Talari. June, I think you may have had a bit of a crush on you. I certainly haven't been receiving any honeyed wine or shoulder massages. <laughs> of course, he's completely... Oh! <laughs> Look at that blush. Well, now that I think of it, when I laugh again, he follows suit. A hint of red spread across his cheeks and nose. I looked June over with curiosity, knowing the brightness of his gray eyes, the flush of color on his skin. He looks healthy, well-rested, and a far cry from the sight I saw on Orion. Seems like you're doing well, June. 
I am. I'm feeling good, and I'm happy to be here on Talaran, especially after finding out the plans to take down Zovac. I'm glad that people are willing to fight against him. Give him a small smile, feeling a similar way. Kadar asked you to help with the plan for the Orionite soldiers. How do you feel about that? It's a bit daunting, to be honest. I don't have any desire to dive back into that world, but I know I have to help. I would regret it forever if I didn't. Exactly. You're doing a good thing. Thanks, Taylor. June takes in a deep a breath as he looks out over the lake, a glimmer of worry dancing in his eyes. I think I have a subtle idea of what it might be the cause of it. June, are you worried that your parents might still be out there? His face falls as he turns to me. I'm not sure if he was expecting me to ask, but I'd like to know his thoughts on the matter. My father is dead. He died the day I escaped the facility. Uh, hmm. Now, did he bring about that, or...? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna accept that he's dead and not ask. But there's plenty of evidence that my mother is still out there continuing their work. He makes a frustrated sound, taking one of the leaves from the vines, covering the gazebo, and twisting it between his fingers. I don't doubt she, d she aligned with Zovac the second she got the chance. She would have done anything in order to continue her research. I'm sorry to hear that. He blows out a breath, dropping his hands to his sides. To be honest, I try not to think about it too much. They were never my family, not in the way that Jules was, but the crew is. I have to remind myself that it's not my fault, the creation of the Orionite soldiers. I wasn't the one who created them, but I can be the one who puts an end to them, once and for all. My mouth twitches into a small smile, but my sadness for him remains. I know all too well how it feels to be ashamed of your family and the need to break away from that. Yep. As if he senses my very thoughts, Juden sighs softly, trailing with the bracelets around his wrists. What about you? You and your sister don't seem to see eye to eye on the future of the system. You're right. I'm not sure how that will affect things between us going forward, but I know I have to stick to what I believe. June makes a small sound, and somehow I get the impression that he approves. I'm glad to hear that, and I agree with you. It's time for things to change. I smile at him, glad to hear that we're on the same page. It makes it easier to know my friends are on my side. You two are lucky that you found each other again. Really lucky. I'm so happy for you, Taylor. He smiles at me warmly, though I can't stop the pain and guilt knowing that he wasn't lucky enough to make it this far with his own sibling. I'm happy too, though I'm worried about what's to come. I blow out a breath. It's easy now, sitting in this gazebo in front of such a beautiful, peaceful view, to forget everything else that's going on in the system. I'm starting to see how the Talari were able to do it for so long. Yep. We have so much line ahead of us, it's hard to think of much else. June nods softly, his sandy blonde hair falling around his face as he does so. I understand that, but I think the most important thing is that we're all together. We'll find a way to get through it. Lizzie suddenly serves on the bench in front of us, giving a little wheeze as he scurries over to June happily. June picks up the lizard, letting him settle on his shoulders, enjoying his usual perch. I'm going to head off. I'll leave you two to enjoy the view. See you later. See you later, Taylor. Leaving June and Lizzie to enjoy the peace of the gazebo, I step out into the sunshine, deciding what to do next. Ah, obviously there's only one thing left to do. I make the decision to head back to my room. It's been a long day, and the thought of curling up in that enormous bed right now sounds like heaven. Taking the elevator, I travel up the spire, leaning back against the wall and feeling the coolness of the glass against the back of my neck. My thoughts drift back to the meeting and to the plans that have been set in motion. It seems like everyone has their part to play. I'll need to speak to Nerissa privately and find out what I can do to help. There has to be something. The elevator slows, and when the doors open to deliver me to my floor of the spire, I head towards my room. Pouring myself a glass of chilled water from the pitcher beside the bed, I sip on the drink as I gaze out the window, admiring the view. It's so peaceful here, so easy to forget everything else that's going on. Part of me is tempted to stay here forever, safe under the protection of the Tilari. An alert sounds, letting me know there's someone at the door. Abandoning my glass, I head over to see who could be visiting me. Vex, what are you doing here? I thought you were at the hospital. Vex makes a quiet, small, discontented sound as I give him space to step into the room. Give him a quick once-over, though nothing seems to be amiss. 
I needed to get out of there for a bit. All the white walls and beeping machines were doing my head in. He paces through the room, glancing around the space as his boots echo over the polished floors. Thought I'd see how you're doing. I shake my head at him and smile. I know what he really means. I'm doing fine. You don't need to worry about me, you know? Yeah, I don't know. Looks like you've got a pretty cushy spot here in any case. I drag my eyes across the room, from the breathtaking views to the water garden to the bed that can easily sleep seven. It's only I feel a little guilty at having this enormous space to myself while he's been stuck in a hospital room. Taking in a breath, I tell myself that it's for his own good, that he needs the help of the Tulare to set his mind straight. How are you feeling? Any luck at the hospital? I'm doing better. Riona was right. The Tulare seemed to know more about what was done to me than any of us. I'm starting to remember more. Memories that were hazy are coming back. The doctors have more to do, but it's working. It's really working. A glimmer of hope ignites within me. Riona had promised that the Tulare could help Vex, and it seems like she was right. What is it that they're doing? They have these machines. They're not meant for a condition like mine exactly, but they're getting the job done. They alter brainwaves, simulate mem memories. We worked out how certain memories are helping to repair my brain, almost like an antidote to its poison. What kind of memories? Ones from when I was a kid. I was close with my mom and dad. We loved food and we loved to play games. I was into sports. Me and the kids in the neighborhood used to kick around a ball out on the street until way after dark. He steps a little closer, a soft smile tilting his lips as his eyes meet mine. But my strongest memories are of you. My mouth parts in surprise, so Vex's face falls suddenly. At first, when the machines were pulling them to the surface, I didn't think they were real. I was too happy in them, happier than I can ever remember being. The places in them were so familiar, gardens, fountains, the city lights, but the feelings, they didn't feel like mine. They were real. I felt the same way. I had never had a real friend, until you. And when we became more than that, it was like my whole world shifted. All of a sudden I was excited about life, and what might happen in the future. Vex reaches out a hand, taking mine in his, and holding it softly. We had something special, and it was ripped away. Is this really the end for us? I pull my bomb lip between my teeth as I shake my head and let my hand drop from his, shaking out the past and the memories of us. Vex, we can't go back to how things were. Not now. I've met someone else, and I'm happy. Aya, I know. For what it's worth, I really like her. Yeah, what I like about this is he completely accepts that your character has moved on. Regardless of who you romance besides him, he accepts that you found happiness with them, and he's happy for you. So that's really cool. He sighs as he rubs a hand over the back of his neck, forcing himself to meet my gaze. If you say that you're happy with her, then I'm happy. I appreciate that. Vex goes quiet, his head turning towards the window as he takes in a deep, slow breath. I know that I could apologize a thousand times and it will never make a difference, but I want to tell you again how sorry I am for the night of the coup, for deceiving you. I swallow down the hurt that rises in me. Nerissa and I escaped with their love, life, but the rest of our family weren't so lucky. While the good memories have been flying back to me, so have the bad. I see them every time I close my eyes. Oberon protecting his children, Celeste and Arlo, their hands clasped together, surrounded by blood. A wave of nausea rises in my throat. If I had been there that night, I have no doubt I would have ended up the same way as my siblings. Vex holds his hands to his face, his voice shaking as it slips between his fingers. I couldn't control any of it. I couldn't control myself. I was like a puppet fighting against its master. Tears fall, slipping down his cheeks and leaving a glistening trail. Vex sniffles and he looks at me. I don't know what I can do to ever make things right. Marissa is alive, and you're getting the help you need. That's what matters. The coup wasn't your fault, Vex. It was Zovac. Even so, the knowledge of the palace, the hidden corridors, Zovac took that from my mind. By force? You're not making this easy for me, princess. I forgive you. I've already forgiven you. There's little use in dwelling on the mistakes we've made in the past. Vex, you have to forgive yourself. He manages to compose himself, though I don't miss the way his hands shake at his sides. I'll try. Placing a hand on his arm, I attempt an encouraging smile. It will take time, and although we'll never fully heal from the past, the least we can do is help each other get through. There's something I've been wanting to ask you, but I didn't dare. Not until you became more stable. You can ask me anything. 
I hesitate a little, but I managed to pull out every ounce of determination I possess. I need to know. When was it real for you? When did it become more than a mission? Back at the palace, you and me... Vex looks away suddenly, his mind drifting back to the past. He's quiet for a long while, and I think he's not going to say anything at all, until finally he speaks. Do you remember the first time we went to the zoo in Silta Vi? You were looking at those weird monkeys, and you were laughing so hard that people started to stare. You said you'd never seen anything like them before. I caught myself thinking that I would spend every day showing you something new, something you've never seen before, just to see that look on your face. No. He catches himself before he says too much, but he's already said more than enough. That's when I knew it was real. I knew that I was in love with you, and that you were all that I wanted. Screw so back in his plans, and Arissa was going to help me find my parents, and I should have stuck with the both of you. I don't know what to say. My tongue sits uselessly in my mouth while my heart pounds in my chest, and neither one of them doing me any good. Taken in a lungful of air, I find myself finally able to breathe. I'm sorry that things can't be the same as they were, but that doesn't change how much I care for you. I want the best for you, Vex. I really do. He nods softly, and I know he understands. I would give the world to you if I could. Anything you asked for. I'll always be here for you, Taylor. I swallow around the lump in my throat, memories of the past dancing behind my eyes. We have to stop him. Zovac. If either of us are going to move on with our lives. We will. The way he says it sounds less like an agreement and more of a promise. It's comforting to know that we're on the same page, despite everything that's happened to us. What about Marissa? Have you spoken to her? Not yet. I'm worried what might happen if I'm near her, given that I was programmed to kill her and all. I need some time to get myself together. Then I'll speak to her. I think that would be good. For both of you. He grins, and a little of the old humor creeps back onto his face. If she doesn't stab me in the gut, you mean? I don't think she will. Kay, on the other hand. Ah, uh, yes. Would you think less of me if I told you I'd been avoiding him like the plague? Not at all. I'd say that's very wise of you. For the time being. We laugh together, and for a moment, it feels like old times. I've hardly been able to admit it to myself, but I missed it. Well, I better head back to the hospital before they send out a search party. You didn't tell them you were leaving? They would never have let me go, and I wanted to see you. I shake my head at him, but I can't stop the smile that slips onto my lips. It seems that some things never change. Back to I say our goodbyes, and once he has safely headed back to the hospital, I decide to sell in for the evening. Dropping down onto the gigantic bed, I grabbed my holopad, noticing a few notifications I'd missed while I was out. I pull a blanket over myself for one to project the screen, realizing that they fr they're from our group chat. I scroll back to the messages I'd missed until I reach the current conversation. Bash, stop clogging the channel with memes. This chat is for communication. <laughs> memes are a form of communication. I'll communicate my foot up your ass if you don't cut it out. Kinky. That's it. I'm muting you all. Dot dot dot. Is he gone? Bash sent a picture. Hey. I click. Woo! New memes! I'm still here. <laughs> that sounds like a you problem. Enough with the memes! You're not the boss of me. Oh, wait. <laughs> June sent a picture. I give up. Lizzie! Demon! You called? With a small chuckle, I put my hollow pad aside, my eyes growing heavy despite the sun having barely dipped below the horizon. I love these idiots so much. The sound of running water soothes me, the scent of water lilies perfumes the air. I let myself go, the serenity of Talaran enveloping me as I fall into a deep and restful sleep. The next morning, I'm up early, getting dressed and ready for the day while the sun rises and feeling refreshed after an early night. A little while later, I find myself walking to the spire looking for Bash. He wasn't in his room, which has made the worry that's sitting in the pit of my stomach start to grow. At the meeting, he seemed fine, but I know how good he is at putting on a show. It's what lies beneath his cool and charming exterior that has me worried. During my search, I spot the two figures near the lake, talking solemnly. As I approach, I manage to pick up bits of their conversation more clearly. Now do you understand everything you'd be giving up? Yeah, I get it, but I'm still not sure. I don't see any other choice. 
There's always a choice, and it's yours. No one can take that from you. But remember that you're also the one who will have to live with the decision you make. Bash nods solemnly, looking torn by whatever it is they've spoken about. If my conversation with Kay yesterday is any indication, I'm sure I know the topic. If you want to talk more, you know where to find me. Thanks, Kay. I guess I have a lot to think about. Kay puts a hand on Bash's shoulder, leaning in and speaking something to him that I can't quite hear. I wait for them to say goodbye, watching KYL3 leave before I approach, ba approach Bash alone and give him a bright smile. Hey, what was that all about? Bash raises his head at the sound of my voice, but he hardly looks happy to see me. I would tell you, but I think you already know. Isn't that why Kay tracked me down? Because you asked him to? I take in a breath, hesitating before I answer. Okay, you've got me there. I spoke to Kay about you and how you were planning to mod yourself here on Talaran. I was worried, and I thought I might be able to help. Are you mad? Nah, I understand, and I know you were worried. Oh, good. What did Kay say to you? I mean, if you don't mind me asking. Bash hesitates, so I'm going to think things through before he speaks again. He gave me some insight on what life would be like if I go through with the mods. He made some good points. I've been thinking about the strength the mods would give me, but not about what they might take from me. That's true. Clutching his baronic arm in front of him, a sad smile tugged from the corners of his mouth. Do you know what you're going to do? No, I put my plans on hold for now. I know there are other things that need my attention. The ace drops to the ground suddenly, a look of guilt coming over him. Taylor, I'm sorry that I didn't listen to you the last time we talked about this, but I didn't take your concerns on board. I was upset. I couldn't see any other option. I nod, accepting his apology. I can see his point of view, even though it's one that slightly terrifies me. Yeah, definitely. It's okay, Bash. I'm not going to write you off that easily. Friends are supposed to support each other, even when they disagree. How are you feeling about everything now? Now, I haven't ruled out the mods completely, but I think I should take some more time to think it through before jumping into anything. Um... This, uh, this is too much like telling him what to do, so I'm not going to say it. Just be careful. Please be careful whatever you decide to do. I don't want anything bad to happen to you. I'll be okay, I promise. Whatever decision I make, I know it'll be the right one. In that case, I trust you, but do what is right for you, not everyone else. He gives a sharp nod, and I can tell that he's taking this seriously. And really, that's the best I can hope for. So, you and Kay are getting along well? I attempt to change the topic to something lighter. Now that I know where he stands with the mods, I have to leave the rest in his hands. Ha! Huh, I thought his name was Kyle at first. Uh, he wasn't too happy when I called him that. And that's why I've been saying Kay will help me. But he's a pretty cool dude. I like him. He actually offered to train with me while we're here. It'd be nice to train with someone who can withstand my bionic. The only one on the crew who comes close is June. That sounds like a good idea. I should probably do some training of my own. Bash gives me an enthusiastic nod. It's true that I've been slacking on my training the past few days, but after everything that's happened, I've needed time to get myself together. You should ask Nerissa to help you with while we're here. I've seen her and Kay training together, and she looks pretty handy with the knife. Now, the, um... Choice of your choice of weapon will affect who Bass suggests you train with. Yeah, maybe I'll do that. I know how busy she is, but if you've seen her training, then she might have some time to spare. I think back to Orion and how I had handled myself in my first real fight. I managed to pull through okay, but I have a lot to learn. With the journey to gold is looming on the horizon, I should take advantage of what little time I have left. I can hardly measure up to Nerissa, but some more practice can't hurt. We'll be heading to Goldus before we know it. And maybe Chapone start to see that I'm not a kid anymore, is what I don't say out loud. I make a mental note to organize myself for training, knowing I'll have to track down the ship and find my gear. Even a thought for later, I turn back to Bash with a smile. So, have you and Oppo managed to get much recruiting done together? We've gotten in contact with a lot of people from Terranium. Most of them are coming here. They should start arriving over the next few days. There's quite a few of them, actually, but the more the merrier, right? I think of the rebel camp on the ground floor, the entire thing littered with tents, sleeping quarters, equipment. Uh, is there enough space?
nice for everyone? We'll make it work. Eldred did say the neighboring spires can house people that can't fit here. The more people we can get here, the better. It'll draw Zobak's attention even further, which will leave room for smaller teams to sneak in the metaphorical back door and take him by surprise. Bash speaks about it also casually, and I can tell that he's used to a life like this. Making plans, fighting his battles, all the things I've never had to do. Wow, this is all really happening. I'm scared. Everything is going so fast. I'm a little scared by it all. I just keep thinking, what if something bad happens? What if someone I care about gets hurt? I couldn't stand to see anything happen to the crew. Bash sighs out loud, wringing his hands together in front of him as he frowns. Now you know what I've been so worried about. It's not easy having those kinds of thoughts weighing on you. I wouldn't underestimate the Camari. They've done a number on our crew. But it's about time we did something about it, don't you think? Bash and I share a look, knowing that for too long, Sobek and his Camari have been getting away with doing terrible things to the people of Theliota. Someone has to put a top stop to it, and if that's us, then we're willing to step up to the mark. With a deep breath, Bash manages to shake off the weight on his shoulders, and instead offers me a warm smile. So, listen, I want to tell you that I was pretty impressed by how he spoke in the meeting yesterday. The way he stood up to Narissa, I would have, wouldn't have had the guts to do that, but I'm glad you told her how you felt. It helps that we're siblings. I can't say that I'm on Elisa and Zane's side. The Chimera started as a Christian clan after all, and look where they are now. But you can't blame the entire planet for that. You can blame it on Zobak. But those are the kinds of decisions that I'll have to leave to others. If you have anything to do with them, they'll trust whatever decision you make. I think back to the moment, wishing that I didn't have to step on anyone's toes, but knowing it was necessary. Thanks, Bash. That means a lot to hear you say. He smiles at me warm and wide, and I realize I needed this conversation with him. After hearing what he had to say, I feel as though I could stop worrying so much. At least for the time being. Well, I should go and meet up with Oppo. We've got more work to do, especially with so many people making their way here. Making our way. Is there anything I can help with? Nah, we've got it covered. Thanks for offering, though. Bash heads off, but I feel a little dejected by the refusal. I would like to help in some way. With nothing left to do with my day, I decide I'll take some time to explore the spire and hopefully track down Narissa while I'm at it. She's going to let me help with this rebellion, whether she likes it or not, and if she doesn't, then I suppose I'll have to find my own way to help. Later that evening, I find myself relaxing in my room. I spent the day out in the spire, and found a mill filled with, filled with all kinds of shops from one of the lower floors. The new outfit I'm wearing is from one of the stores. It's a little more flowy than what I'd usually choose to wear, being in the Talari style, but it's comfortable, and the silky fabric feels amazing against my skin. An alert goes off on my holopad. When I check the notification, I see that it's a message from Narissa. Taylor, I need your help with something important. Will you meet me tomorrow morning at the gazebo? I haven't seen her all day, but not for lack of trying. I've been hoping to corner her and ask for something to do. Tomorrow, it seems like I'll have my chance. I'll be there. Sending her my reply, I flop back against my bed and stare up at the ceiling, blowing out a long breath. Knowing that Narissa needs my help with something eases the restlessness that's been growing, gnawing at me, but only a little. I'm looking forward to this meeting with her. Alert for the door goes through the room, and at once, I bolt upright and run my hands over my clothes, smoothing down the fabric. I had messaged me earlier, asked if she could come to my room to hang out tonight, and I'd happily said yes. If I'm being honest with myself, I've been looking forward to spending some more time with her since we got here. So this establishes um, what the following scene is going to be. And the only way to get the CD is to pick the first one. I hope that something will happen between us. I'm nervous. This will be the first time we've been here alone here on Talarin, and while I don't know what will happen, the possibility that something could happen is beginning to make me sweat. And the fact that I'm actually hoping something will happen is making it worse. Not wanting to seem too eager, I wait a good few seconds more before I head for the door. Aya grins at me as I greet her, a hand on her hip and a familiar sparkle in her eye. Hey, cutie. Thanks for letting me hang out tonight. I'm happy to see you. Come in. 
Aya steps inside, but immediately curls back to me, walking backwards as she looks me over with an approving grin. Is that a new outfit? You look amazing. And I assume if um, I'd accepted the ring from Narissa, then I would have commented on it. But I didn't, so she's not. Though, you always look amazing. My face starts to warm. I'm not used to compliments, but I can't deny that I enjoy them, especially coming from her. Thanks, I just got it today. So you like it? He wasn't so sure. I love it. Aya spins again, taking a few steps through the room before she stops abruptly, her hands going up in the air. Whoa, this room is incredible. Holy shit, is that a water garden? I chuckle as she races over to the ornamental pond that separates the room from the window. She dips her fingers in the water as though checking that it's actually real and not some hollow. You mean to say you don't have a giant obnoxious pool in your room? Nuh-uh, I thought I was lucky to get a mini bar, but this is something else. I bite down on my lip, a little unsettled by that, despite my teasing. We've been happy to have a room like everyone else. I'm just staying around again. tells me that Nerissa may have pulled a few strings to get me an upgrade. Ayas rolls her fingers around in the water before pulling them out and taking the droplets from her skin. I'm gonna have to come and visit you more often. This room is ten times better than mine. Good, because I'm starting to get pretty lonely in this big old room. I can fix that. With you here, I'd say it's a hundred times better. She steps forward and takes my hands in hers, her fingers still a little wet and cold from the water. I'm sorry we haven't had any time to hang out earlier. I would have loved to, but I've been so busy talking with the Catalfins here, I honestly don't know where the time has gone. It's okay, Aya. You don't have to apologize. And besides, you're here now. That's right, and I finally have you all to myself. With a small tug on my hand, Aya urges me to follow her. We get settled in the lounge area together, me relaxing against a couple soft cushions, while Aya lays her head back against my lap. Her dark hair sways around her as she gazes up at the ceiling, and I can't stop myself from playing with it, burying my fingers in the soft strands before gliding them across her scalp. That feels so good. I smile softly and closes her eyes, relaxing against me. I gaze down at her as she breathes gently, looking as though there's nowhere she'd rather be in the world. My heart swells with emotion. A part of me can hardly believe that I've found someone like her. Someone who is kind and fun, and sprinkled with just the right amount of mischief. All of a sudden, Aya's, Aya's eyes flutter open as she stares up at me. Her face changed from pure bliss to something more solemn. My heart drops the side of it. What's wrong? She turns her face away, glancing across the room, though she doesn't move her head from my lap. I was just thinking. There's this feeling I used to get when I was a kid. I was fearless. I wasn't afraid of the world or what it held for me because the people I loved were right there beside me. She reaches up to find my hand, clasping her fingers together and holding on tight as she re relives something from her past. When Catalpa was destroyed and I lost my family, that feeling went with it. I became terrified of everything, even my own shadow. I was so scared of losing anyone else. The small smile lifts her eyes and curves her lips as she looks up at me. But right now, with you, I'm not afraid of anything. I know that this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. I stare down at her in awe, my heart so full with affection that I hardly know where to begin to tell her how much she means to me, that everything she's feeling, I'm feeling too. Aya sits up slowly, turning to face me, both of her hands clasping mine as she smiles widely. We're going to get through all this, and we're going to take the life we want, because we deserve it, Taylor. We both do. Her eyes shine with so much passion that I can't stop myself from leaning in to kiss her a hand trailing up her arm and feeling her warmth against my skin. She smiles against my lips as she kisses me back, leaning into me, a soft, satisfied sound escaping her. After a few long moments, we pull away from each other slowly, our eyes locked, my face hurting from smiling so much. I can't wait for that life and to have our own adventures together. I whisper to Ayame, who laughs softly as she reaches up to brush the side of my face with warm fingers. But, you see, Taylor, that's the most amazing thing. Our adventure has already begun. Aya leans in to kiss me, her lips sweet and soft against mine. I close my eyes and let myself feel every part of her, the way her hands graze over my arms, how her tongue licks my bottom lip and draws a soft groan from my mouth. 
When she pulls back again, something on her face has changed. Her eyelids have grown heavy, her smile devilish, and my heart pounds harder in my chest at the sight of it. Please tell me that I'm not the only one thinking what I'm thinking, wanting what I want. She runs a hand over my thigh, and I don't miss the insinuation. It's not just you. I want this too. Aya takes my hand and helps me stand, leading me to the bed with a wry smile. Slowly, seductively, she pulls her tank top up over her head before pushing her leggings down her thighs and kicking them off with a wry smile. Is it weird that I'm feeling nervous? I know I shouldn't be. Can we just take a moment to appreciate the underwear? I mean, Catalpins are described as space mermaids and this pattern uh, kind of reinforces that a bit. It's really pretty though. The words trail off and her eyes gaze over me, drinking me in. Are you nervous too? So, never done this before. Done this a little bit, or done this a lot. I'm pretty sure I picked a little, but it's not my first time. Oh, but it's not like it's my first time. Me either, but it's our first time together. We should probably take things slow. Such a pretty CD. Aya pulls back the sheets on the bed, giving us room to slip beneath the silky coolness of the blankets. Our lips meet and our legs tangle together, both of us giving and taking, tumbling together beneath the dim light. We learn from each other, guide each other, our kisses ones of desperate need of love and lust. The soft glow of the dim lights blanket us, blankets us, taking us far from the worries of the world to a place where there's nothing but me and her. Skin to skin, we explore the depth of our connection, our emotions turning physical, heat blossoming within our bodies. The sounds of untamed pleasure and whispered words fill the room around us, and when stars burst behind my eyes, the world spins with them. And that's it! Um, there was going to be an update because um, the bash route um, wouldn't even get to that point. I don't know if the update has gone through. It doesn't look like it. There should be more CGs. Because there's a, um, a new one. New ones for this chapter. So yeah, here's the music box. And if you look at this right here. N-L-P. So. And then of course now it's open. So I'm assuming those are Narissa's um, initials, and there I said when it's fixed. And then of course Narissa, when you see her again, when you reignite it. Okay, so yeah, that's it. Um, obviously this is going straight to YouTube, so um, there should be a link to um, play Andromeda 6 in the description. Um, there are plans to do an NSW, NSFW um, DLC of the uh, Night with Your Ally. I will not be playing that. I will not be live streaming that because of course it is NSFW. And I wouldn't feel comfortable streaming that on Twitch, and I think it would be against Twitch's um, rules anyway. So, um, the plan is to work on that and um, episode 8 at the same time. Um, so, yeah, um, I hope you enjoyed this. Please like, share, comment, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And thank you for joining me.